what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmaid to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Thank you, Father Justin. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor Nancy Murphy. Nancy is a professor of Christian philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. She's also an ordained minister in the Church of the Brethren. A native Nebraskan, she received a BA in philosophy and psychology from Creighton University in Omaha, a PhD in philosophy of science from UC Berkeley, and a THD from the Graduate Theological Union. She's a member of the board of directors of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences at GTU and has been a regular participant in the center's ongoing conversations and publications. Her first book, Theology in an Age of Scientific Reasoning, won the American Academy of Religion Award for Excellent. She's authored nine other books touching on topics from Anglo-American postmodernity to philosophy of mind and neuroscience. And I'm happy to say that she's also managed to offer courses for us in philosophy at DSPT. This afternoon, she's going to tell us at last how to keep the non-reductive in non-reductive physicalism. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nancy Murphy. It's a great honor for me even to be introduced by Father Dodds, no matter what he said, because when I was just a struggling student uh, my first years at the Graduate Theological Union, the um, um, committee that uh, did uh, admissions, I think sort of sneaked me in on the basis of the, the amount of philosophy I'd studied, but without nearly enough theology. And so while I was just barely, um, getting my nose above water. Um, Father Dodds was already a very respected professor at DSPT, so I'm honored to, to be honored by him. I commented yesterday in a response to Brendan Rickenbach's paper um, that I wish I could have, have heard all of the, the papers here before I arrived and then wrote my paper and then time traveled back uh, to present something in which I could have explained uh, more of the uh, relevance uh, of what I'm saying to things that others of you are saying or thinking about. And um, um, so even though I'm a bit of a misfit uh, in this group with my uh, uh, being an, a non-Thomist, um, I was delighted to be invited, especially because uh, there are so many papers on Aquinas' anthropology. He has seemed to me to be the most di difficult of significant theologians to classify in terms of dualism or something else. I expect to go home needing to rewrite much of my description of his work in my forthcoming textbook. He appears to be a very complicated monist until you get to his argument for the survival of the rational soul during the intermediate state. And in current terminology, we would at that point, I think, have to call him a holistic dualist because uh, he recognizes that a rational soul without a body is not, in Christian thinking, a complete person. My plan for this lecture involves two parts. First, I'll give as brief an over account as I can of why I favor a monistic approach to Christian anthropology 
which following fellow philosophers of mind, I generally call non-reductive physicalism. Where I hope to make my contribution will be to make good on the claim that it is possible to be ontologically physicalist with regard to humans without reducing our traditionally understood higher faculties to mere brain functions. So in section two, I'll present an account of complex dynamical systems theory. I believe that it not only solves the problem at hand, which uh, Bas von Frossen expressed well as by saying that there's been no satisfactory account of physicalism in the 20th century, uh, but also uh, because it pre I believe it presents a genuine worldview change that's been happening really quickly over the space of only about 50, 10 to 15 years. So first, why Christian physicalism? There are plentiful writings from the 20th century up to today arguing against dualism and for monism, along with an enhanced appreciation for the centrality of bodily resurrection in the good news of the gospel. However, during the 18th and 19th centuries, biblical critics had called miracles into question, especially the resurrection of Jesus. So whereas for centuries, the immortality of the soul had been combined with uh, the notion of the general resurrection in our eschatology, enlightened Christians focused only on the immortality of the soul. But as biblical criticism became more sophisticated in recognizing the need to read words, such as the Hebrew nephesh, in, uh, the, in their context, the question was raised around 1910 of whether nephesh had rightly been translated into Greek as suke, and then eventually as soul. Now, in speaking to pro, uh, uh, in speaking of Protestant developments, I've discovered that um, moving from the liberal GTU to teach at the Evangelical Fuller Seminary, one always needs to specify whether one is speaking on the one hand of liberal or mainline scholars, or on the other of conservatives. Among liberal Protestants by the 1950s, there was near consensus that dualism was a Greek accretion to a more authentic Hebraic theology and ought to be rejected. Conservatives are going through the same process now, in part due to agitators from the GTU like myself and New Testament scholar Joel Green. It's been difficult to sort out Catholic scholars. Using my quick and dirty research methods of reading secondary literature, it seemed that during the 20th century, Catholic biblical scholars were increasingly likely to reject dualism, but no simple account of Catholic theologians was possible. Again, I'm learning a lot at this conference. It's now recognized that no simple distinction can be made between Greek dualism and Hebraic monism. We have too much of a tendency to read Descartes back into early Greek and Christian writers. But suppose that dualism of a material body and a non-material soul or spirit was not biblical teaching. We need then to explain somehow how so many scholars could have gotten it wrong for so many years. Among Catholic scholars, this would be at least from Augustine up to Thomas, about eight centuries. And for Protestants, it's been more like 16 centuries. This question would require volumes to answer adequately. So I present only a few scholars' insights. First, Joel Green emphasizes that the biblical authors had different concerns than we do, and what happens at death was not one of them. This has been confirmed by several contemporary Jewish scholars as well. Second, I have found James Dunn's work in New Testament extremely helpful. Without falling into the 1950s error of trying to characterize the Greek view, he distinguishes between what he calls aspective versus partitive 
accounts of human nature. Aspective versus partitive. He writes, in simplified terms, emphasizing the sim simplification, while Greek thought tended to regard the human as made up of distinct parts, Hebraic thought saw the human more as a whole person existing on different dimensions. As we might say, it was more characteristically Greek to conceive of the human person partitively, whereas it was more characteristically Hebrew to conceive of the human person aspectively." End quote. Thus, many of the ancient Greek philosophers were interested in the question, what are the essential parts that make up a human being? In contrast, for the biblical authors, each of the anthropological terms stands for the whole person thought of from some particular, uh, uh, according to some particular dimension. For example, Paul's distinction between spirit and flesh is not the later distinction between soul and body. Spirit stands for the whole person in relation to God. Dunn claims that flesh had a spectrum of meanings, but from some of Jesus' teachings, I would guess that a central meaning was the hugely important role of, the, of kinship in the culture of the day. Michael Velker writes that the heart is an exce exceptionally important entity, and I wouldn't know, I'm not sure I would like him to keep the word entity in there. Uh, the heart is an exceptionally important entity in Paul's anthropology. As in the Old Testament, it connects vegetative, emotional, noetic, and voluntary functions. If suke signifies the earthly, corporeal, mental unity of the human person, then the heart, cardia, stands for the emotional, voluntary depths. It is via the heart that the divine spirit reaches the human body and its mental capacities." End quote. It seems that Velker's account of heart incorporates bits of Thomas's vegetative, sensitive, and rational souls. My colleague at Fuller Seminary, uh, Velimati Karkinen, rejects dualism, and he claims that the best of current theologians do also. I don't know how much agreement he would get in this room. But he does not like my term, non-reductive physicalism, because he thinks it emphasizes the physical at the expense of all of our other characteristics. Based on the complex account scripture gives of the various aspects of human life, we decided that the best term for a Christian theologian to use would be multi-aspect monism. If biblical research and so much of contemporary theology were not at least open to monism, I would find myself in a tough spot. As did Ernan McMullen, I believe we need to seek consonants between theology and science. And it is certainly the case that biology, and especially neuroscience, point toward monism. I also seek consonants between theology and contemporary philosophy. During the 1960s and 70s, Anglo-American philosophical method was understood to be conceptual analysis. That is, in any statement except a tautology, there were empirical elements, now ceded to the sciences, but also conceptual elements. For example, the empirical question of how we acquire knowledge uh, is science's job, but analysis of the concept knowledge was the philosopher's job. A correct analysis was thought to provide universal knowledge immune to scientific refutation. The conceptual arguments at the time were on mind-body dualism versus mind-brain identity thesis. Arguments for and against dualism, for and against the identity thesis appeared to be interminable. However, W.V.O. Quine's de demolition of the analytic synthetic distinction made empirical knowledge once again relevant to philosophical arguments in ways that I won't go into here. 
Uh, his critical arg uh, article came out in 1951. In um, philosophical theologian Jeffrey Stout's terms, conceptual archaeology needs to replace conceptual analysis. We need to know what a concept means in a particular era and for a particular community of scholars. Consequently, the findings of neuroscience, making it increasingly difficult to explain why a mind is needed in addition to the brain, has turned nearly all secular philosophers into physicalists. Many claimed to reject reductionism, but in my judgment, no one had an adequate account of how to avoid it. My claim is that there are good biblical and theological reasons to prefer physicalism, but only if good reasons can be given to reject reductionism. Otherwise, we lose all of the higher human capacities important to a theological vision of humankind. Daniel Dennett's book, um, Freedom Evolves, has received a lot of attention, but many of his reviewers accused Dennett of, a, of bait and switch arguments. Now, according to Dunn, Paul's anthropology emphasized our essential sociality, reflective thought, deep emotions and sustained motivations, and the ability to be touched by the Holy Spirit. My account of Dennett's simulacra of human capacities does not line up in direct opposition, but I believe it indicates enough of what the reductionist is willing to give up. Intentionality in the philosophical sense, um, including beliefs, desires, and intentions, is essentially uh, is essential for human sociality. Dennett claims we do not possess these characteristics. However, because attributing them to others allows us to predict behavior so well, this justifies us in taking the intentional stance toward others. Also, Dennett substitutes for altruism a concept of Ben selfishness. Because of the social payoff of being perceived as a good person, and the fact that the easiest way to maintain this perception is to be a good person, we behave so as to appear to be altruistic, but it is for selfish motives. This has been described as pseudo-altruism. Likewise, he's been accused of providing only for pseudo-responsibility and pseudo-freedom. His account of human thought is nothing more than computer-like manipulation of strings of symbols. And Dennett, being one of the most strident of atheists, does not even think to provide an account of pseudo-spirituality. So the question for the next section is how to account for the fact that we are not, as Dennett says, at the mercy of an organization of a trillion mindless robots. So section two, atoms versus complex self-organizing dynamical systems. Now, I've been speaking of these biblical and theological issues for years, so the first section of my paper was easy to write. However, I'm not experienced about speaking about complex systems theory. My mentor at Berkeley, Paul Feyerabend, once said that significant conceptual changes begin when a group of people speaking nonsense to one and begins with a group of people speaking nonsense to one another but it eventually makes sense, and a new paradigm or conceptual scheme is created. I think I'm still a little bit on the verge between sense and nonsense, but here goes. First, why has reductionism had such a hold on modern thought? Second, what are the best accounts of anti-reduction that still work within the usual vocabulary of philosophy of science? And finally, my attempt to convey the sense in which complex systems theory contributes to a new after-modern worldview. I've become leery of using the word postmodern because I'm so frequently misunderstood. Already in the mid-17th century, Thomas Hobbes developed a theory of human nature and society based on an analogy with the new atomism in physics. He was also the first to propose the concept of a hierarchy of sciences 
reflecting a hierarchy of complexity, not to be confused with the hierarchy of being that uh, stretched from ancient Greece uh, right up through uh, early modern thinking. In the early days of modern physics, causal reductionism was, I believe, inevitable. Following Epicurus, the essential assumption was that everything that happens is a consequence of the motions and combinations of atoms whose behavior was deterministic. The atoms were not thought to be affected by the holes that they composed. Thus, the behavior of the holes from the levels of physics to chemistry to biology and finally to psychology or sociology or politics was ultimately the product of causation from bottom up. And complex entities were not causes in their own right. So the defeat of causal reductionism in the human case needs to be the defeat of bottom up causation or as some would, what would prefer to say, part to whole determination. The most significant criticisms of causal reductionism fall into three historical stages. First, an early emergentist movement from approximately 1920 to 1950. Um, then uh, the exploration of downward causation beginning in the 1970s. And currently, new attempts to define and defend both emergence and downward causation. Now, if bottom-up causation is the problem, does downward causation solve the problem? I believe that Robert Van Gulik has done the best job of describing and defending downward causation. He says that although the objects picked out by the higher level sciences, such as psychology, cognitive science, are indeed composites of physical constituents, the causal powers of such an object are not determined solely by the physical properties of its constituents, but also by the organization of those constituents within the composite. That is, a given physical constituent may have many causal powers, but only some subsets of them will be active in a given situation. The larger context or pattern of which they are part may affect which of its causal powers get activated. Thus, the whole is at least partially determinative of what contributions are made by its own parts. Such patterns or entities, he says, are stable features of the world, often despite variations or exchanges in their underlying phys physical constituents. Many such patterns are self-sustaining or self-reproducing in the face of perturbing physical forces, for example, DNA patterns. Finally, the selective activation of the causal powers of such a pattern's parts may, in many cases, contribute to the maintenance and preservation of the pattern itself. Taken together, these points illustrate that higher order patterns can have a degree of independence from their underlying physical realizations and can exert what might be called downward causal influences, but without requiring any objectionable alteration of the underlying laws of physics. Higher order properties act by the selective activation of physical powers, not by their alteration. Downward causation and emergence are complementary concepts in that emergence explains how the complex entities form in the first place. I believe that Terence Deacon has provided the best account so far of emergence. He distinguishes three types or levels. There is no emergence in mere aggregates. The important difference between an aggregate and a system is that in a system, it is relational properties of the constituents as opposed to primary or intrinsic properties that constitute the higher order. Cases of first order emergence include the viscosity of liquids and typical feedback systems such as a thermostatically controlled heating system. Because fluctuations in such systems are dampened out across time, it is possible to give rough reductionist accounts of their behavior. <clears throat> 
Second order emergence occurs where there is amplification of a fluctuation rather than dampening. Systems in which this occurs are nonlinear, that is, their history matters. A simpler sort of self-organizing system is one in which higher order patterns selectively constrain the incorporation of lower order constituents into the system or select among possible states of the lower level entities. And this is Van Gulik's point as well. More complex second order systems are al also autopoietic. Um, this means that they change the lower order constituents themselves. An example is that the behavior of an organism can, in some instances, uh, change its own genome uh, by means of its behavior. An autocatalytic cycle is more complex still in that the system manufactures some of its own components. Here, a cell is an example. All life, Deacon says, involves second order emergence of this more complex sort. Deacon distinguishes between first and second order as well as third order emergence in terms of what he calls amplification logic or the topology of causal processes. In first order emergent systems, there is non-recurrent causal architecture, a simple bottom up and top down relation in which global properties of the system, for example, density of components makes a difference to the relations among the components and thus to the behavior of the whole system. Second order systems have more tangled or recurrent causal architecture as a result of the amplification of lower level fluctuations. This amplification changes the total state of the system in a way that makes a, de a decisive difference for the future development of the system. This can lead to new orders of complexity. Third order emergence involves the interaction among at least three levels and appears naturally only in the biological realm. Here, a variety of second order forms emerge, such as, as cells, and are selected or constrained by the environment, but in such a way that a representation of its form is introduced into the next generation. The system has a memory. The simplest example is the evolutionary process. The micro level, the genome, in interaction with the organism's environment, directs the construction of the organism, which is the mid-level, whose reproductive fate is determined top-down by the environment, the top level. The preservation of information regarding the organism's success in the environment, a form of intergenerational memory, is a means by which relatively stable populations of successful organisms can be produced, but within which future fluctuations appear. Some of these may be amplified, preserved, and re-entered into the system by means of interaction with the environment, thus enabling the appearance of still higher degrees of complexity. Deacon describes such systems as exhibiting recurrent, recurrent causal architecture. The most important advance, of course, is the development of memory in individual organisms. Due to these more sophisticated accounts of emergence and downward causation, uh, do we have finally a solution to the problems of reduction in human capacities? At first it may seem so, but then the question arises, how is it not the case that humans are in a sense trapped by a combination of downward causation from our environment between, uh, um, trapped between a combination of uh, downward causation and the biological factors, bottom-up causation, that do still contribute to our behavior. Where is there room for human agency? This is why we need the resources of complex systems theory. Systems thinking has been developing over the past half century 
although it has only recently begun to have a significant impact. Systems theory draws from a number of sources. There are significant roots in general systems theory developed from 1928 through the 1970s by thinkers such as Ludwig von Bertalanffy. The idea was that the structure of complex entities, regardless of the academic field they fell into, could be modeled mathematically. Another early source was the study of cybernetics, the study of automated control systems, whether mechanical or biological. Current contributions come from information theory, nonlinear mathematics, the study of chaotic and self-organizing systems, and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Examples of the systems of interest range from autocatalytic chemical processes at the most basic, to weather patterns, insect colonies, social organizations, and of course, human brains. Alwyn Scott, a specialist in nonlinear mathematics, but also neuroscience, states that a paradigm change in Thomas Kuhn's sense has occurred in science beginning in the 1970s. He describes nonlinear science as a meta-science based on recognition of patterns in kinds of phenomena in diverse fields. This paradigm sh shift amounts to a new conception of the very nature of causality. And he says, in a way it's a return to an Aristotelian conception of causation. Francis Heiligen, professor at the Free University of Brussels, has made a bolder, bolder claim. Systems theory provides the resources for an entirely new worldview, including ontology, epistemology, and ethics. I attempt to set out here some of the essential concepts involved in this change. Several authors call for what might be called a shift in ontological emphases. Alicia Warrero, an Aristotle scholar, by the way, says that one has to give up the traditional Western philosophical bias in favor of things with their intrinsic properties for an appreciation of processes and relations. Heiligen states that the basic ontological categories for systems theory are agents and actions. Systems have permeable boundaries, allowing for the transport of materials, energy, and information. The boundary is a matter of the tighter coupling of the, its components with one another relative to their coupling with entities outside the system. The crucial components of complex systems are not things, but processes. I think this is a really critical uh, uh, statement. The crucial components of complex systems are not things, but processes. So for example, from a systems perspective, a mammal is composed of a circulatory system, a reproductive system, and so on, not of carbon, hydrogen, calcium. The organismic level of description is largely decoupled from the atomic level. That is, if the functional system works, it does not matter what its components are made of. Systems are different from both mechanisms and aggregates in that the properties of the components themselves are dependent on their being parts of the system in question. For example, uh, Eleanor Stump uh, gave, uh, 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 suggested an, an, an example uh, ye yesterday or the day before uh, uh, apologizing for its being rather gruesome. Uh, she says that if an eye is gouged out and put down on a table or something, uh, uh, it, it no longer is really an eye because it no longer has the function that it was supposed to have. Philosophers distinguish between internal and external relations. External relations do not affect the nature of the relata but internal relations are partially constitutive of the characteristics of relata. An essential assumption of the predominant modern worldview was that the world is composed of things related to one another externally. Systems theory takes the relations among constituent processes 
of a system to be internal. Systems range from those exhibiting great stability to those that fluctuate wildly. This is due to the fact that complex systems are nonlinear, that is, the current state affects the development of each future state. The difference in stability is due to the extent to which the system is sensitive to slight variations in initial conditions and also to the extent to which there are feedback processes that either do or do not dampen out fluctuations. Systems at the extremes of this spectrum of stability are not of great interest to systems theoreticians. For example, a thermostatically controlled heating system is very stable, but produces no novelty. Uh, imagine a reverse thermostat that provides positive feedback, such that the hotter the building becomes, the more it increases the heating. This system probably is unpredictable, but it's not likely to last long. Thus, the, the systems of interest are those in the middle of that spectrum. Chaotic systems are now uh, familiar to many of you. They result from having a sensitivity to initial conditions that falls into a narrow range, resulting in their behavior falling into a predictable range of states. More interesting are those at the edge of chaos. Here the system has the freedom to explore new possibilities and may jump to a new and higher form of organization. An understanding of how this can happen in terms of physics comes from the study of far from equilibrium thermodynamics. Such systems are called complex adaptive systems. They are characterized by goal directedness, um, at least insofar as they operate in order to maintain homeostasis. In the process of self-maintenance, they may create their own components. Complex adaptive systems theory has dramatic consequences for understanding causation. While ordinary efficient causation is presupposed, systems theory developed specifically because such causation is inadequate to describe the kind of systems we're talking about. This inadequacy is in part because complex systems operate on information as much as on energy and matter. More important, is the fact that the relations among the components of a system need to be thought of in terms of constraints. An efficient cause makes something happen. A constraint reduces the number of things that can happen due to the fact that the components are internally related to one another such that a change in one automatically changes the other. Morero says that the concept of a constraint in science suggests not an external force that pushes, but a thing's connections to something else. More generally then, constraints pertain to an object's connection with the environment or its embeddedness in that environment. They are relational properties rather than primary qualities in the object itself. From information theory, Warrero em employs the distinction between context-free and context-sensitive constraints. For example, in successive throws of dice, the numbers that have come up previously do not constrain the probabilities for the next throw. The constraints on the dice's behavior are context-free. In contrast, in a card game, the constraints are context-sensitive. The, co the chances of, say, drawing an ace at any point in a game are sensitive to history because the rules of the game, the number of cards in the deck, and so forth create relations among the possible outcomes such that the probability of one occurrence is related to all of the others. This account suggests that a better term in place of downward causation is whole part constraint. The higher level system, the whole, does not exert efficient forceful causation on its components. Rather, global features of the system are such that a change in one component changes the probabilities of the occurrence of uh, other lower level events. Due to the role of probability in complex systems, 
It's necessary to do away with the sharp distinction between determinism and indeterminism, either quantum indeterminacy or complete randomness. The appropriate middle term is propensity, uh, coined by Karl Popper to mean an irregular or non-necessitating causal disposition of an object or system to produce some result or effect. An understanding of the concept of propensity has been aided by the study of nonlinear mathematics and especially chaotic systems. It begins with a visual or imaginary state space or phase space, which is uh, a space with some number of dimensions in which a trajectory represents possible transitions from one state of the system to another. Chaotic systems theory introduced the concept of a strange attractor to describe the development of chaotic systems over time. This is a shape in phase space that depicts the boundaries within which the system can be found during its evolution. From the concept of a strange attractor, the idea of an ontogenic landscape has been developed. This is a topographical map in which valleys represent areas in phase space in which the system is likely to stay. Peaks represent states in which the system will only be found as a result of a major perturbation, such as the injection of a great deal of energy. So the system has a propensity to remain within the valleys. The topography represents a summation of the general effects of a vast number of contextually constrained interactions among the system's component processes. Um, now, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, some work that my husband and I did on uh, distinguishing modern from postmodern philosophies. And uh, one instance of that was his recognition that individualism has been a very important um, ingredient in modern thought. And um, the question was, what would be the, uh, what would it take to escape from um, <coughs> arguing back and forth over uh, different forms of individualism? He called that the um, uh, individualist or metaphysical access, axis. And uh, we argued that people who just leave behind those modern arguments and get out of that space altogether are the ones that deserve to be called postmodern. And um, it, it's only been in, in these past 15 years that I came to see individualism as but one manifestation of the metaphysics of atomism and reductionism. And it is only now that I know the escape route from this modern set of arguments, namely complex systems theory. Conclusion. Neuropsychologist Warren Brown and I have argued that this set of new concepts, particularly those of complexity theory, give us the conceptual tools to explain how downward causes cause without violating the causal closure of the physical and without postulating causal overdetermination. Humans, who are complex, self-organizing, dynamical, adaptive systems, are partially decoupled from their biology, attend selectively to environmental constraints, and thus are able to become agents in their own right. However, higher animals possess these features as well. So the uh, remaining question is what distinguishes adult humans' morally responsible actions from those of animals? Brown and I adopted Alistair McIntyre's philosophical account of moral agency, and we summarized it this way. Morally responsible action depends on the ability to evaluate one's reasons for acting in light of a concept of the good. We then investigated the cognitive prerequisites for such action, among which we include a sense of self, the ability to predict and represent the future, and high order symbolic language, allowing for abstract concepts such as goodness, virtue, etc. So with this addition to the argument that organisms are often the causes of their own behavior, the argument I've made all too briefly here, 
I believe it is possible to make the claim to have eliminated many of the reductionist worries that seem to threaten our traditional theologically informed conception of ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. To respond to Nancy's talk, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Robert John Russell, known as Bob to most of us at GTU. He's the founder and director of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences at the Graduate Theological Union, where he's also Ian G. Barber, Professor of Theology and Science, and with Ted Peter, he's the co-editor of the journal Theology and Science. He holds a PhD in experimental physics from the University of California at Santa Cruz and an MDiv and MA degrees in theology and science from the Pacific School of Religion at GTU. He's also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. Bob is a prolific author of books and articles dealing with theology and science Notably, the many volumes proceeding from the International Conferences on Theology and Science sponsored by CTNS and the Vatican Observatory, exploring divine action in relation to quantum mechanics, chaos theory, evolution, molecular biology, and the neurosciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Bob Russell. Thank you, Michael, for that gracious introduction. And I'm sure you can all understand, having heard Nancy, why it was an absolute uh, change in my career uh, when Nancy came to the GTU and asked me to be on her committee. So it's a pleasure to respond to Nancy. In fact, it's a rare privilege to respond to my colleague and friend of nearly 40 years. It is especially wonderful given the nature of her, her paper with its inclusion of such diverse areas as biblical and theological anthropology atomism versus a dynamic systems theory, and a response to the problem of reductionism through an appeal to emergence and downward causality in complex dynamical systems. In this response, we'll first summarize the second part of Nancy's paper and then raise three questions about it. In the second part of her paper, Nancy begins with the new atomism in classical physics and with it the inevitability of reductionism, causal reductionism. Under the shadow of Thomas Hobbes, reductionistic theory of human nature and society, the defeat of causal reductionism became crucial. A vital step was taken through the articulation of downward causation by Robert Van Gulik. While a system is composed of its parts, the causal powers of a system include both those of its parts and their organization. It's critical. In the latter case, the system is at least partially determined by what contributes contributions are made by its parts. An additional step in the defeat of causal reductionism was achieved through the idea of emergence in nature. Murphy cites Terry Deacon as, quote, providing the best account so far of emergence and spelled out in terms of three orders of emergence. Now she asks a crucial and pivotal question. Quote, do these more sophisticated accounts of emergence and downward causation solve the problem of reductionism of human ca capacities to biology? End quote. While pre previously she thought they might, she now raises a point which I find very interesting, and I'm quoting from the text that I received to, to comment on. Ha quote, how is it not the case that humans are, in a, in a sense, trapped by a combination of downward causation from their environment and the biological factors that do still contribute to their behavior bottom up? Where is there room for human agency? This is why Warren Brown and I turned to the resources of complex theory. Here she turns to the work of philosopher of science, Alicia Guerrero, and her 1999 extraordinary book, Dynamics in Action. Murphy paraphrases Guerrero in calling for, quote, a shift in ontological emphasis from, quote, things with their intrinsic properties to processes and their relational properties. This shift is warranted by the fact that biological systems are, quote, decoupled from their atomic co components. Quote, if the functional system works, it does not matter what its components are made of, unquote. 
Such systems have what philosophers call internal relations, while elements such as atoms have only external relations. Hence, complex dynamical systems enhance our understanding of causation. Along with routine efficient causation, we now find that constraints are placed on the system by the internal relations between its components and by the relations to the environment which serves as its context. Guerrero also distinguishes between context-free and, cont and context-sensitive constraints. So, as Nancy said, successive throws of a dice are independent of the results of the past throws. But a card game proceeds, as a card game proceeds, the probability of an ace changes by the results of past uh, cards. This leads Murphy to recommend that we speak of whole part constraints instead of downward causation. I think it's a very important shift. Here, the whole does not exert efficient causality in its parts. Instead, the whole changes the probabilities of the behavior of its parts. Let me read that again. Here, the whole does not exert efficient causality in its parts. That would be overdeterminism. Instead, the whole changes the probability of the behavior of its parts. This, in turn, leads Murphy to set aside the traditional sharp distinction between determinism and indeterminism and adopt, instead, the idea of propensity, which she got from Karl P. Popper, which Arthur Peacock used extensively in his own work. The cluster of propensities acting within the trajectories of complex dynamic systems can be imaged as a three-dimensional landscape within which the system moves in time as a result of the contextually constrained interactions with the system. Murphy concludes by describing a major shift in worldview from modern to postmodern theologies. This change involves three shifts which she and Jim McLennan articulated. One, from foundationalism to holism in epistemology. Two, from meaning as reference to meaning as use in the philosophy of language. And three, from an individualist understanding of human nature to something which lay along what McLennan called a metaphysical axis. Murphy tells us that she has come to understand that individualism is but one manifestation of the metaphysics of atomism and reductionism. Hence, the escape route from modernism lies through insights regarding the expanding understanding of causation offered by complex systems. As Murphy writes, quote, complexity theory gives us the conceptual tools to explain how downward causes cause without violating the causal closure of the physical and without postulating causal overdeterminism. Humans who are complex, self-organizing, and dynamical adaptive systems are partially decoupled from their biology, attend selectively to environmental constraints, and thus are able to become agents in their own rights. And I think this is an absolutely brilliant move. I thoroughly commend it, and I would love to see it pursued aggressively. So I'd like to ask, raise three kind of baby questions to this, because I'm so thoroughly in agreement with her paper. One, in her paper, Murphy appropriates Guerrero's distinction between external and internal relations and between context-free and context-dependent constraints to lead us towards what she calls a major change in worldview. Nevertheless, Murphy does not draw explicitly on what arguably is Guerrero's most important point, namely a critique of Aristotle's rejection of self-causation and its persistence in and its profound shaping of the contemporary discussions about agency. It is worth quoting Guerrero at some length here, since her critique of Aristotle is particularly relevant to the Thomistic context of this conference. Quote, to explain Aristotle's analysis of organisms' actual behavior, it is first necessary to understand his view on change. All becoming, he maintained, involves the transformation of something that is only potentially into something that is actually so. There are two kinds of potencies, potencies. One, the passive potency to be acted upon. The other, the active potency to act on. Inanimate objects and the elements possess only the first kind. Organisms have both. However, insofar as a thing is an organic unity, it cannot be acted on by itself, for it is one and not two different things. For organisms to act on themselves, they would have to possess simultaneously both the, po the passive potency to be acted upon as well as the active potency to act upon something else. Since nothing can simultaneously possess both potencies with respect to the same property, nothing can act on itself. But animals obviously act through cell motion. Aristotle therefore explains animal cell motion by splitting the organism in two, soul, the unmoved mover, 
and body the mood. Strictly speaking, the prohibition against self-cause is thereby upheld. Nothing moves itself, and so things remain to this day." Unquote. While Murphy did not specifically mention Guerrero's challenge of Aristotle in her paper, she and her co-author Warren Brown do refer to it explicitly in their, their pivotal work of 2007, alluded to before, did my ignorance make me do it? Indeed, it would not be an overstatement to say that the entire book by Murphy and Brown is shaped by a two-sided coin, the rejection of body-soul dualism on the one side and the acceptance of self-causation on the other. Let me repeat that. The entire book is shaped by what could be called a two-sided coin, the rejection of body-soul dualism on the one side and the acceptance of self-causation on the other. Here are a few sample texts from the Brown-Murphy text. Guerrero convinced us that the defeat of neurobiological reductionism requires an account of how a complex system as a whole can be the cause of its own behavior. We shall argue that Aristotle's assumption accounts for the, for the reluctance to recognize that humans eventually become the causes of their own moral capacities. Two, uh, second quote, the goal of this book, the Brown Murphy book, will be to end with the picture of an organism that is an agent, the cause of some of its own behavior. Third quote, our position is that complex organisms are in fact self-causes, self-movers. Fourth quote, our suggestion then is that free will will be understood as being the primary cause of one's own actions. So my first question is quite straightforward. What led to the inclusion of much of Guerrero's work in, in Murphy's paper, but not the inclusion of what seems to be Guerrero's most important point, namely her challenge to Aristotle's prohibition on self-causation? This seems oddly missing, particularly in light of arguments Murphy gives in the, in the first part of the paper against body soul dualism and their clear relation to the rejection of Aristotle's prohibition on self-causation. My second question consists of two parts, first regarding human agency and then regarding divine agency in nature. The first goes to Mur Murphy's crucial claim, which I will quote again. Complexity theory gives us the conceptual tools to explain how downward causes cause without violating this causal closure of the physical and without postulating over-determinism. Well, Suppose for a moment the physical world is fully deterministic, as we thought it was according to classical physics. In this case, I don't see how Murphy escapes a violation of causal closure, and particularly the problem of over-determinism in the bodily enactment of human agency, not in the formation of free will, but in its enactment. If I am in a straitjacket, then even if I come to a decision about what to do that is not entirely determined by my biology or my environment, how do I carry out that action? So I decide to get up and leave. Obviously, I can't. If I'm stuck in the straitjacket of all determining physical forces, I cannot enact free will. Can I even be said to have free will? The second part of my second <laughs> question focuses on the question of God's action in the world. And here, in previous writing, Murphy explicitly takes into account and depends upon quantum indeterminism. In her outstanding 1995 paper for the second conference in the Seeking His Vatican series, Murphy argues that God acts at the subatomic quantum level where nature is characterized by ontological indeterminism. And here is a very helpful quote from Nancy. My proposal is that God's governance at the quantum level consists in activating or actualizing one or another of the quantum's entity's innate powers at particular instants, and that these events are not possible without God's action. They're not possible without God's action. I claim that God's participation in each macro level event is by means of God's governance of the quantum events that constitute such macro level events. Thus, there is no competition between God and the natural determinants because by hypothesis, the efficient natural causes at this quantum level are insufficient to determine all outcomes. So my question, very simply then, is this. Why is, is why divine action requires indeterminism in nature when human freedom seems to take place with no appeal to, to enact free decisions? Why do you need indeterminism for God and you don't need it for us? Third, my third question relates to Nancy's telling us of McLennan's 
reference to a, quote, metaphysical axis, which helps distinguish modernity from postmodernity, an axis which moves us from atomism to complex dynamical systems. Murphy tells us that she hadn't understood McLennan's reference to a metaphysical axis until her recent work, The System Theory, in which systems consist not so much in aggregates of individual entities, but holes within holes, like organism, organs in an organism. Holes which have internal relations as well as external ones, in context-dependent constraints, function along with context-independent ones. But I wonder if she has fully explored the depth of this shift, alluded to by McLennan, from the metaphysics of atomism, which dominated the natural sciences of the past three centuries, to the metaphysics of complex dynamical systems. I know from personal convictions, conversations with her, that as an analytic philosopher, Murphy may not want to press the metaphysical implications of such terms as atoms and systems too far. Nevertheless, at this conference, organized and hosted by DSPT, I anticipate there to be a great deal of interest in exploring the potential richness, richness of Thomism for a metaphysical shift from atomism to system theory, particularly in light of uh, Neil Thomist's exquisitely detailed appropriation of the Ar philosophy of Aristotle. I have been wonderfully helped in, in understanding the Thomistic world of thought by the writings of an extensive conversation with Father Michael Dodds, especially in his recent books, The Unchanging Love of God and The Unlocking Divine Action. It would be very intriguing to ask whether Murphy would find resources in such Thomistic arguments about holism and downward causation helpful for her project of defending non metaphysicalism by providing a shift along the metaphysical axis, or would her commitment to analytic philosophy be satisfied with a less developed metaphysical interpretation as suggested by her everyday terms of atoms and dynamic systems? Let me close by expressing once again my enormous appreciation for Nancy's work in this paper and in the many publications which preceded and which feed and nourish it. I look forward to hearing her responses to my questions and continued conversations and lasting friendship. Thank you. Bob had some questions, especially for you, Nancy. You might, if you'd like to, sure. respond. I'll try to be very, very brief. Okay. <laughs> uh, with, re with regard to the first question about why I didn't say anything about um, Warrero and uh, Aristotelian uh, self cause, I simply don't know enough about Aristotle to have added anything to what uh, I just barely understood from her. So um, I wouldn't have been making any real contribution there. Um, the second point, um, well, let me take your paragraph. Um, suppose the physical world was fully deterministic, as it is according to classical physics. Um, I don't see how Murphy escapes violation of causal closure. Um, if I am in a straitjacket, and even if I can come to a decision about what to do, that is not entirely the product of my biology and my environment, how do I carry out that decision, say to get up and walk out of the room, if I am stuck in the straitjacket of all determining physical forces? And I really believe that it's a massive conceptual shift to see that that is not, that the objection is assuming the old worldview and I will happily confess that I, it took me about six years to make the leap myself uh, to the point where I stopped seeing that as a problem. Uh, but another, thi another way to get at it is um, uh, if you talk about the problem of neurobiological determinism of human behavior, the question really amounts to the question of whether you can reduce uh, human thought processes and, and behavior to the neural level. And if you can escape from reductionism, then it doesn't matter whether the bottom neural level uh, is uh, completely deterministic or uh, to, some, to some extent indeterministic because you're still decoupling your um, higher level faculties from what's going on in the, in the wet what works. Um, 
And then uh, the question about divine action. Uh, I worked on a project with Nancy Cartwright and some others who have been uh, trying to show from a philosophy of science point of view and also knowledge of very, um, um, uh, very careful analyses of how things actually happen in the physical world that the modern concept of uh, universal deterministic laws is really not the best way to get at why something happens. And uh, Nancy and her um, colleagues in this project would say that um, you're much better off looking at the actual mechanisms that are going on uh, in producing the effect. Uh, and so I was invited to participate and, was a, and so my job was to say whether this had solved the problem of divine action or not, since uh, we had recognized at the beginning of our Vatican project that it was the deterministic laws of modern physics that created the problem of divine action in the first place. But what I had to say back to Nancy and her group is that even if you get rid of deterministic laws of nature, you've still got the, uh, the question of uh, the causal joint. Uh, just at what point does God's action uh, become instantiated in the world. And I argued on a theological basis that we have to have a much stronger concept of the eminence of God in all of matter uh, in order to uh, uh, tackle that problem. And, um, well, I guess I'll just, I, I don't think I can say briefly, you know, anything further about that, so. Why don't both of you, uh, Okay, so uh, now we're open to questions for either speaker, and we'll begin here. Uh, please speak into the mic. Uh, yes, Jim Hanning. The point of my question overall is whether or not there's not a substantial slipperiness about system thinking. And in order to give this some specificity, I want to give two examples. First of all, I'm sure a number of the friars here are uh, uh, knowledgeable about the work of Nicanor Ostriaco. Our Nic Nicanor Ostriaco. You uh, say they're f A number of the friars here, I'm sure, are aware of his work oh, okay. as a Dominican. And one of the things that he's done, in particular in looking at bioethical questions, is to say, look, I'm going to start from systems biology. And he takes himself to be saying something new and significant. But he never says, and because of systems biology, we don't have to talk about substances. And when he talks about the human person, he wants to talk in hylomorphic terms. So we have an example of applied system thinking in biology without any sense that we have to give up on substance. Now, I might as well quote a Jesuit since I've quoted a Dominican. Father Norris Clark has done wonderful work in metaphysics and the metaphysics of the person. And Clark says, citing many of the particulars that you've cited in contemporary life, that we need to add to Aristotle's list of categories, system. And he talks about, as an example of system, kinship. And I think you mentioned kinship, I'm not sure. And he talks about system as a, a relationship, but a relationship that's very, very special because the multiplicity of the relata. All right, but now we come to the relata. He never says the relata are other systems. He says the relata are substances. And when he looks at the families uh, made up uh, of real human beings and they're coming together in a kinship system, he wants to say that they are body, soul, composites, and substances. So here we have someone in an Aristotelian context wanting very much to emphasize system, using all kinds of contemporary examples, but not for a second losing track of substance. 
which takes us to, and I hope I'm getting to the end, I'm sure you do, <laughs> which takes us to an axiom, axionis sunt suppositorum, actions are of substances, not actions are of relations, but actions are of substances. And I'll end with a pop culture, uh, uh, I don't know what to say, coda. You're interested in moral responsibility, we're interested in moral responsibility, and at the level of pop culture, there's this expression, blame it on the system, which is a dodge to avoid personal responsibility, which takes us to persons which are matter, soul, composites. And I don't know how you're going to say moral responsibility if you suppose that systems can obviate substances. Well, first of all, um, in my work, I always emphasize that you can't take a word um, in philosophy uh, and just assume that it means the same in every context. For instance, scientific realism has nothing to do with um, the realism uh, that was pitted against nominalism in the Middle Ages. The same word, realism, in both cases, but uh, very, uh, no way, no way uh, that you can connect those together. And it, it sounds to me that like the uh, first author that you mentioned um, is, um, uh, in a sense, um, neologizing. Um, he says that um, don't, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, well, I think what you said his claim is, is that uh, even when you move to systems theory, uh, that doesn't mean you reject the concept of substance. Is that correct? Yes. Um, well, what uh, it would be, uh, before I could answer that, I would need to know how he defines substance, what era of philosophy he has in mind when he's using the word. Um, and with regard to Nori Clark, um, there are some systems uh, whose parts could be called uh, plain old substances. But think of the human being uh, in society. The society is a system. It's made up of human beings. Human beings are very complex systems. Humans are made up of very complex systems. Even a, a, a cell is a complex system. And a mitochondria within a cell is a complex system. And so uh, you have to go a long, long, long way down uh, to get to something that is, isn't itself also a system. So. Um, well, wasn't it you rather than any particular system or constellation of systems that proposed the position you've just proposed? Well, because of the organization of this system, uh, and its complexity, I have the capacity to selectively attend to my environment, try to think about what folks here might be interested in hearing, um, uh, overcome biological impediments, like I'm too sleepy to keep working on this paper, and so forth. And so it's the unification of myself and my ability to be selectively attentive both to what my body is telling me and to what the social context is telling me uh, that gives me wiggle room in order to be an agent. Thank you. Another question from here. Markus Rother, Eichstätt. Um, I really like your approach and I've been thinking in the same direction for about two years now, but I always come up with one problem. You have been talking about complex dynamic systems with all kinds of self-reference, self-organization, self-maintenance, and so on. Um, I think that is a good description of life, but I have a problem to take it as a description of personhood or subjectivity, and this is precisely because 
uh, subjectivity is more than self-reference, it's conscious self-reference. I can refer to myself without knowing that I refer to myself. And now, uh, if, we would, if we really want to have a non-reductive physicalism, we somehow have to explain how self-reference turns into conscious self-reference. And so my problem with the approach is that I don't see how that could work. Well, half of the answer to that is um, I intended to start my paper by saying it's really weird to be speaking at a conference on um, uh, consciousness, uh, person, and soul, because uh, I don't think scientists yet have an adequate theory of how consciousness arises. And if they don't, you can't expect me to. But um, uh, there is the capacity, and this is so highly emphasized by Karl Rahner, the capacity for thinking about our own thinking, that is self-transcendence. And that's what McIntyre picks up in his concept of morally responsible action. I can ask myself, what did I do? Why did I do it? Was the reason that I did it a good reason? And uh, was it a good reason prudentially or especially was it good reason morally? And so that's one le level of self-transcendence. But um, I have a, a scenario in one of my, my books where um, um, somebody comes under the um, influence of Sartre and he thinks he's got total freedom comes under uh, uh, different philosophical influences, and so he keeps reflecting on his previous view of mor morality and finds it uh, defective, and so he transcends it with a different view, which changes his sense of what he is and is not able to do and should or should not do and so forth. And so even within the um, uh, area of concepts of moral morality, moral systems, uh, I can reflect on the moral system that I've been operating with and decide that that was a, a lousy uh, moral system, such as, say, utilitarianism. And in that sense, I transcend my previous uh, self-transcendence. And uh, uh, according to Rahner, we can keep on going. But of course, we don't have an infinite lifetime, so. But, oh, and uh, it's possible with brain maps to map out the regions of the brain that are involved in the kind of thinking that is evaluative of the lower level thinking. Here's an example. Uh, you're in somebody's house, the phone rings. Um, uh, behavior says you don't answer somebody else's phone. Now you're in, the, you're in the house, the phone rings, but the owner of the house is in the shower. Now you're in a different context, and that different context uh, uh, leads to a higher level overriding of ordinary polite behavior, and you go answer his phone. So. Uh, Different levels, different parts of the brain are involved in those um, higher order evaluative uh, decisions than uh, are involved in the decisions themselves. So you can begin to map self-transcendence um, as a philosophical concept onto actual uh, models of brain systems and uh, regions and you begin to, to match them up. Uh, Christopher Wetzel from the DSPT. Um, th this question regards the, the mathematics that you're using uh, in this, uh, this, this system. It seems that there's a strong relationship between mathematical developments and philosophical and scientific developments. And so you see that the, the philosophy of Descartes is very influenced by his understanding of geometry. Could you speak a little more clearly? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. I, I'm, I've got old ears. So this is about the mathematics. So it's the mathematics of various philosophers has influenced their philosophy as well. So Descartes is very influenced by his understanding of geometry. So is Leibniz by his, in, his, his understanding of calculus and Newton as well. And, and you can continue on to see how uh, now chaos theory is now influencing 
uh, philosophers as well. And so the question, though, is uh, on the one hand, in the natural sciences, it's perfectly all right for us to abstract away from the real system, the real entity that we're studying, to a mathematical model that helps us to explain it better. Um, but I wonder if we risk in that abstraction process uh, leaving aside some higher order features, higher order phenomena that are not captured even in a complex model like a complex dynamical chaotic system. Um, and that in doing so, we, we leave aside some philosophical residue that really ought to be picked up by an even more complex integrated uh, notion like form. And then uh, sort of compounded upon that, it does seem that these, these notions of process, of, of energy, of, of the, the, the flow of information, as we start adding those things into our, our models, as opposed to mere just sort of elements that move around. Let, let me stop you there. Um, if you make a map of the globe that is one-to-one -one correspondence of size to size, uh, you don't have a map of the globe. You've got a paper globe. Uh, and so you have to ask how much detail needs to go into a model for the model to serve the purpose we, we want it to serve. And a very interesting case is the uh, increasing complexity of the modeling of climate systems that uh, uh, larger computers and um, better understanding of uh, feedback systems and so forth, uh, how much progress has been made in the last 20 years in making uh, predictions regarding global weirding. Eric Chastain, um, I'm at Tennessee um, in Knoxville, University of Tennessee. So Speak up. up it's up, uh, up. my name's Eric Chastain. I'm at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. So it's always it was uh, it's always good to hear about complex dynamical systems. I'm I'm uh, pretty pretty happy to work in the area for for a while. So it's it's great that philosophers are thinking about this. I just wanted to ask you um, about, um, I guess, the, the title claim in the paper, the non-reduction you know, non part. Um, because if you look at the mathematics of complex dynamical systems, you can actually determine just from the equations themselves everything about their behavior, not just kind of like moment to moment, you know, initial condition, plug it in, you move to the next step. You can actually determine entirely using the equations, the attractors and all of the final rest states. And you could actually just make a computer simulation of where it'll end up going. So it seems like um, you can't really say that there is any kind of uh, non-reduction there as, as far as non-reduction to the um, laws of motion or dynamics. So I just wonder what what you've thought, um, you know, whether you've thought of this issue and how you've thought of it, et cetera. Bob, would you like to say something about what you have uh, uh, concluded regarding uh, the determinacy or indeterminacy right. of chaotic systems? Yeah, I think you're speaking to simple chaos, and there it is deterministic but unpredictable. But Nancy's talking about complex, nonlinear chaotic systems, which are not deterministic. Are you speaking to both? Okay. Sensitivity to initial conditions and kind of like, okay, you know, you start with some noise or some imprecision in the initial conditions, you could end up in a completely different place. You've really yeah, got to enunciate yeah. okay. your words let me, let me try. Right, right. Let me, so let me try, I'll try a quick response. I think if you go to a second and third order complexity that Terry Deacon looks at, you, don't, you transcend the problem. You're talking about his first order. That's I'm, about as best we can do. No, no, I mean, so okay. I am I'm We'll quite talk serious. about it later, yeah, after yeah. the conference. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, I should have 
apologize at the outset because I'm going to sound like I'm giving you a hard time. I think, well, I did that once before. And I, I did that once before, and Jim McClendon was sitting next to me, and you dispatched me in a sentence with no subordinate clauses. And, <laughs> and Jim stuck his elbow into, into my ribs, and he, and he said, she fixed your wagon. <laughs> well, be all that as it may, I think the, the truth is more interesting. We live on different planets, and you touched the place where I live when you cited Alistair McIntyre and Alicia Warrero, and um, uh, uh, Warrero's argument is long and complicated, and I'm out of my depth, but in her last chapter, she said, if you want to understand action, you have to deal with narrative. And M McIntyre's remarks on narrative I, in this audience are probably well known. If you, if you look up Hamlet in the index to, I think it was after virtue, not Greek justice. Uh, it's in his uh, article, um, Epistemological Crises, Dramatic Narrative it's and the Philosophy there. of Science. Yes, absolutely. Uh, my contention, and th I think this is the place where we disagree, in, and I'll estimate your position in the form of a question, but my contention is that action and narrative have a circular relationship. You can't tell what an act was unless you have at least a candidate narrative, uh, and we have ways of criticizing narratives which I can't explain very mm -hmm. well, but somebody should. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a task mm -hmm. waiting to be done. And um, the circularity is hermeneutical. Uh, the normal presupposition is that we can spot an action and narrate it later. And um, my um, impression is that the resort to complex systems theory, and I looked at it some years ago um, when, when I was writing Living in Spin. Uh, Great title. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the only way to live. There, I mean, it's, <laughs> there ain't any other way. Yeah. Um, the specter, the, the fright monster is some kind of idealism. Uh, and hermeneutics is too close to idealism for comfort. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of the fact that individuals are complex systems uh, involved in, embedded within, uh, and partially determined by uh, various social systems, which are equally, if not equally com complex, and how is it that we place individuals in the, their social settings? And I get this uh, more from um, uh, Leslie Brothers than from Alicia. Uh, it's by narrative uh, gossip that um, we position other people, and uh, therefore also ourselves, within social structures. Yes. Um, so and so is the guy who will knock your teeth out if you insult him. He's, um, uh, she's the the Here person who will, who will always I mean, bring I, you I, a cake I, when you're sick. Um, and what's that based on? Well, that's based on stories that you could tell of when he actually did knock people's teeth out. So I don't see a pro I just don't see the problem. Um, you're making judgments about what matters, and those are editorial judgments. Um, which no. makes narrative primordial. No. Um, to describe something in moral language is thereby to evaluate it. Of course. And that's important. But that presupposes a prior relationship between narrative 
the actions and the, the motions, if any, of the actions? Well, the narrative's been going al on a long, long time before you and I got here. Sure. Uh, it might, let me point out two other places where I think we disagree. I don't think organisms are systems. An organism's material substrate may qualify as a system for some purposes, but th there's more to an organism than its material substrate. Um, I don't think I've said that. No, I, I don't think that. I've. I, I don't think I've said you. anything that disagrees with that. Okay. That's the whole point of trying to get away from biological reductionism. Um, I need to let it go at that okay. because I've forgotten. Okay. Um, Sorry, I interrupted the you. The second point. No, no, no. You're fine. No, that's um, good. I think. Thank I think you. I enjoyed the talk greatly. And it was thank you for I coming. Can, <laughs> I can follow it better than most. <laughs> well, well, okay. <laughs> I think, I think we'll all uh, let it go at this point and thank both of our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>